Well, this is very exciting. This is the end of our study on the fruit of the Spirit. We are coming to the fruit called self-control. And that list for you, if you have your Bibles and you want to turn to it, is in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. It says the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's a good list to memorize. Uh, is that one of our Awana verses? Does anybody know if that's on our Awana verse? I'm hearing yes, it is. I didn't have Awana when I was a kid, but I do remember memorizing that verse. And so that comes back to me. And so when you take a look at the fruit of the Spirit, one of the things that we've been talking about over the last two months is that fruit is grown. You have to cultivate it just like the tomatoes in my backyard. I had to cultivate them. I've been taking out weeds. I've been watering them. I've been doing all kinds of things. And I've got tomatoes all over the place because without cultivating, you can't grow things in your garden. Without cultivating the fruit of the Spirit, you can't cultivate, you can't grow that either. What we call self-control actually doesn't start with ourself. Did you know that? It actually starts with God. Self-control starts with the Holy Spirit. He's the one that initiates it. It's because self-control is a characteristic of him that he passes on to us as we partner with him. You see, it's God's expectations. It's his standards. It's his ideas that we must become conformed to. Our lives must be controlled by the Holy Spirit. And not only does he develop the standards, not only does he give us how to live, but he also helps us in that. The Holy Spirit is who helps us to be self-controlled. After all, it's God that initiates it. But that doesn't mean it's all God and not us. We work together to create this self-control. Now, that line in that song, holiness is Christ in me, did you catch that during worship? Holiness is Christ in me. To live a holy life, a life that's set aside for God, means that you will develop these fruit of the Spirit. Spirit. But if Christ is not in the center of your life, if he's not the one that's controlling it, then the, the seed that's inside you is not going to grow up and produce the fruit of the Spirit. It's got to be Jesus Christ. Because this list of fruit of the Spirit, these are things that God has the corner of the market on. The devil doesn't have any self-control. Did you know that? So if you are lacking self-control, if there's an area of your life where you're lacking self-control, you have a good friend in the devil because he doesn't have any self-control. The devil is out of control. If you look at chaos in the world today, Anybody think of places in the world where there's chaos? The devil is right in the midst of that. That's his baby. So if we want to cultivate self-control, then we need to allow God to plant his spirit within us. Now let me give you a definition of self-control. Self-control is the exercise of moderation and self-restraint. Self-control is the exercise of moderation and self-restraint. And you say to me, Pastor Nate, what's moderation? I've never heard that word before. Okay, that means when you say no. Everybody, let's say no together. No. That's what moderation means. It means saying no instead of yes. Now, we live in a culture that says yes to everything. Anything goes. Yes, I'll do this. Yes, I'll take that. I'll get more of that. But the nature of Christ is to live in moderation. There are some things that we need to say no to. There are some things as parents that we say no to our children. My daughter, Juliana, I said I wouldn't use you, but I'm going to use you this morning. She won't be scarred for life, trust me. It'll only hurt for a few moments here. This week, she's come up to me and she said, Dad, can I do this? And I'd say, no. And then she'd say, I'm going to go talk to mom. I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. 
So sometimes we have a hard time saying no. We have a hard time hearing no. Do you remember? That was good. I like that. Self-control. I like it. Do you remember the Just Say No campaign in the 80s against drugs that Nancy Reagan touted? Well, that was a good first step. Just say no. We need to learn how to say no. But we need to go beyond just saying no, and we need to just do no also, right? You can't just say no and then turn around and do what you just said no to. You got to continue it and do no. No is a a word that we hear, hear early and often, most of us, typically from our parents. Unfortunately, sometimes we learn that no also means if I cry a little bit harder, then I'll get what I want, right? If I make enough noise, then maybe I'll actually get what I want, and no doesn't really mean no. If we're going to learn self-control, we've got we've to learn how to tell ourselves no and really mean it. So we're going to practice that this morning, okay? I want you guys to kind of get in your own head here, all right? And we're going to practice saying no to ourselves. You ready? Okay? On three. One, two, three. No. All right. Some of you need some help on this, all right? You you haven't said no to yourself in a while. Let's do it again, all right? One, two, three. No. All right. So we need to learn how to say no. This is the basis of self-control. There's a verse in Proverbs that I want to share with you. Proverbs 25, 28. It says this. Like a city whose walls are broken through, is a person who lacks self-control. A city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. Now, back in Bible times, the cities were walled for protection from enemies. And if there was a part of that wall that was broken down and was able to be accessed, then that city was vulnerable to attack. Without self-control, we also have walls that are broken down that leave us vulnerable to attack from our enemy, the evil one. So walls are made for a couple different purposes. The first part is that walls keep people out. The second use of a wall is that walls keep people in, or walls keep things in. Now, I have a a fence next door in my yard that's in the backyard, and uh, the fence is used to keep my dog, Wicket, inside. If the fence wasn't there... Wicket may have the tendency to wander off into the church driveway. And then he might make himself liable to being squished by some of the cars that come in because, because um, they, uh, they um, drive by and he can't see around the corner of the house. And so the fence is a wall, if you will, that keeps Wicket in and keeps him safe. And this is the kind of thing that we also need. The walls that we need to build up in our lives for self-control are the kind that keep us within God's will. So the walls are, are those things that keep us from going outside of God's will. And anything outside of God's will, we call that sin, right? The wages of sin, the results of sin is death. And so if you are saying, I, you know, like Renee was sharing in the uh, children's message this morning, I have a right to disobey God. Well, the the results of disobeying God are hurt and they're bad. They're always bad. And so sometimes because the devil deceives us, we think, oh, it's going to be fun and it's going to be good. And we only learn later that it's always bad. So what we need to do is we need to build up those walls around us so that we don't go outside of God's will. This morning, I want to take a look at, at two people in the Bible and look at how they fared with this, this concept of self-control. We're going to look at Joseph. We're going to look at David. Two guys who were full of faith, who loved God, who served God, but had two very different results with self-control in their life. Let's take a look at Joseph, first of all. He was perhaps one of the most mistreated bo- people in the entire scripture. Sold by his own brothers into slavery as a kid, He lived in a land that was not his own, had to learn a language, a culture that was completely different. None of it was his fault. And yet, because of his character, because of his self-control and his dependence upon God, he rose up to be the person in charge 
of an Egyptian uh, named Potiphar, his entire household. This Egyptian Potiphar was a very wealthy man. Well, in this position uh, that, uh, that Joseph held, Potiphar's wife uh, tried to seduce him, and uh, Joseph responded to that by running out of the house. Potiphar's wife, then, you may know the story, Potiphar's wife then lied to her husband about it, and Joseph ended up being thrown in jail for a crime that he didn't commit without any possibility of parole. Because in those days, prison didn't have the possibility of parole. Well, along in prison, Joseph, because of his character, because of his self-control, he became uh, very useful to the prison warden. He rose up in the ranks, if you will. In those days, you could... You could be a person of influence within the prison. And uh, Joseph became second in power in the prison only to the warden himself. Everything was under his area. And in this context, the, uh, the butler and the chef of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, were thrown into jail because they had done some things that were wrong. They had some dreams, and Joseph interpreted those dreams. In exchange for that, he said, tell Pharaoh... Give me a kind word so I can get out of this prison. I am unjustly accused. I've done nothing wrong. Well, this fell on deaf ears until one day when Pharaoh had a dream, and all of a sudden, the man remembered, oh, I know a guy that can interpret dreams. And so Joseph was taken out of the prison, interpreted Pharaoh's dream for him, and as a result of that, direct result of that, he became the number two person in power in the land of Egypt, which was the United States of its day, the most powerful nation on the earth. And so Joseph became a very powerful man as a result of his dependence upon God and his ability to live a self-controlled life. In the midst of the famine that occurred, and as Joseph was was, uh, distributing food, he saw his brothers come to to Egypt one day, and as he saw them come towards him, they didn't recognize him, but he was so overcome by emotion that he had to run out of the room to find a place where he could break down into tears. Now, at this point in the story in Genesis, there's a verse that seems pretty insignificant, but I think it's very telltale to describe Joseph's life. And here's what it is. Jo- Genesis forty-three thirty-one. It says this. After Joseph had washed his face, he'd been crying, he came out and controlled himself. He said to his servants, serve the food. Joseph's life was characterized by self-control. Because of this self-control, God was able to use him to impact the lives of millions of people. This verse is really a description of who he was and how he lived his life. As a boy, he couldn't control himself. He told the dream to his brothers. He was a proud young man. But through circumstance, God chose to give him the opportunity to live a self-controlled life, and he rose to the occasion. Now, we have many modern-day examples of of people who do not control their emotions or their temper, or they allow um, their uh, sexual desires to run out of control. You see these people in the media, it seems like every day, whether they're athletes or they're businessmen, their politicians, whoever they might be. You see examples of people whose behavior is very influential. They have an influential position because of their popularity or their role. Now, their example to the rest of the world is a poor one. But the the ability to have self-control is not just about being a good example or a bad example. It's about passing the tests that God gives to us. And Joseph, he passed those tests with flying colors. As we pass the tests that God gives us to live self-controlled lives, then God will also give us greater opportunities to do things for his glory, just like he gave to Joseph. So that's Joseph. Let's take a look at David. David, the king of Israel, he was a man of strong will. The youngest of eight brothers, he was not afraid to say what he thought and to back it up with action. David was a a, a young man that was always in the thick of things. When he fought Goliath, 
he was ready to mix it up. And he was the youngest runt of the whole litter there. But he, David had a problem. You see, in spite of the fact that he had a strong self-will, he lacked self-control. You remember the story? One springtime when the army of Israel went out to fight its enemies. Typically the kings went out to fight the battles along with their armies, but David stayed home. See, there were problems that were brewing inside of his heart that only showed themselves to come into reality when David saw Bathsheba. It was because David had already made some decisions. His his walls of self-control had already been broken down that when he saw Bathsheba, he couldn't resist. And so, you know the rest of the story. He was caught in the devil's trap and committed adultery. Now, sexual immorality is one of the plagues of our society. Millions are caught in its trap. However, this is nothing new. In the New Testament, we understand that the Roman civilization was plagued with the same thing that we see in our society today. There were temples to the god of sex in every Roman city, temple prostitutes. It was socially acceptable to go to the temple prostitute. Now, Paul, in the midst of trying to share Christ with people, he wrote about this plague. And in the book of Galatians, before the fruit of the Spirit, he talks about the desires of the sinful nature. And number one on that list is sexual immorality, Galatians 5. Paul had to address this problem in his day just like our day as well. So let me address it very quickly this morning. The Bible tells us clearly that God's will for human sexuality is within the context of a marriage between a man and a woman. Regardless of what we may feel, regardless of what our society says, this is what God says. Genesis 2, 24. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. If we are to exercise self-control under the power of the Holy Spirit, then abstinence outside of the marriage relationship is the holy and righteous thing to do, the only holy and righteous thing to do. But I want to say that Self-control is greater than our sexuality. It really has to to do with saying no to the indulgence of our pleasures. In our land of abundance, saying no is a difficult thing to do. We have a great abundance of time, of money, and of opportunity compared to the rest of the world. While these things are good things, too much of a good thing is bad. Now I want to ask you potentially a very difficult question this morning. I want you to think about this. Where do you have a tough time saying no? Where do you have a tough time saying no? Do you have a tough time saying no when you sit down to eat? Is that where you have a tough time saying no? Do you have a tough time uh, with the amount of time you spend on the screen watching videos? Do you have a tough time with the images that you see? Do you have a tough time with the words that you use? Where do you have a tough time saying no? This is the area that Jesus wants to give you the power to grow the fruit of self-control. I want you to hold on to that thought this morning because we're going to come back to it in just a minute. We flirt with danger when we don't take the opportunity to seriously cultivate self-control. This danger is not so much the danger of God punishing us. Here's the danger. We will lose out on the opportunity to be used by God to do things for His glory and for His kingdom if we do not have self-control. Now, Paul, the apostle, was a great example of a man who lived under the control of the Holy Spirit. And I want to share with you this morning, I believe it was because of his great control in his life that he was able to accomplish so much for the kingdom of God. He planted churches, multiple churches, in many different countries at the same time because his life was submitted to God. Now, in Michigan, several years ago, um, we planted a church. We helped to to plant a a church in the the city of Grand Rapids. 
We were there for four years. And I can tell you that planting a church is an extreme, extremely difficult thing to do. It requires great dedication and commitment. It's a challenge in any culture. But Paul was able to do it across many different cultures at the same time because of his great self-control. Now, listen to this description of what he says about his life. It gives us insight into this, into how he approached his life. 1 Corinthians 9. It says this, Though I am free and I belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To win as many as possible means to to win people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. He goes on to say this, I become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in his blessings. Now, did you catch that? Paul said that he said no to things that he could possibly do, things that he had the right and the freedom to do in order that other people who didn't know Christ could have the opportunity to come to know Jesus Christ. Paul said no when he could have said yes. He had the right to say yes. How many of us have the right to say yes and we say yes instead of considering the fact that if we said no, maybe Jesus might be be able to use us in a greater way for his glory and his kingdom than we're being used right now? I believe the kingdom of God is not limited in its ability to advance by us having a lack of ability to talk to people about Jesus Christ. I think the kingdom of God is limited because we don't say no to ourselves. We don't put limits on ourselves. We live in the land of freedom. But if we want people to be free from the power of the devil, we must put limits on our freedoms. You see, self-control is not just to keep us from doing bad stuff. It's necessary if we want to do good stuff as well. Here's a verse, a couple verses that really puts an exclamation point on this. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 24, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. They do it as not running aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and I keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. You know, those athletes competing in the Olympic Games back then, they're just like the athletes today. They have to say no to a lot of things that the rest of the world says yes to in order to compete at a high level. They have to say no to the comforts of ordinary life so that they will be able to be ready to run the race. If we exercise control, self-control under the power of the Holy Spirit, then it will keep us also from being disqualified as credible witnesses to Jesus. It will allow us to faithfully invest our time and abilities for the sake of the kingdom of God. The goal that we are looking for is to bring pleasure to Jesus Christ, to honor him with our lives. There is no goal that's greater, and there is no reward that is compared compared to that. There is no medal, there's no trophy, there's no reward that can compare to the the words that will come out of Jesus' mouth when you see him face to face. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful. There's nothing that can compare to that reward. This is the goal that we are striving for. Christ follower, did you know that your goal is to present yourself a living sacrifice to Jesus Christ? To say, this is my life. Everything that I have is yours. If we are able to live in the power of the Holy Spirit and be self-controlled, then God will be able to use us to his glory. But it is a daily process of following following the Lord. I I don't have an easy answer for you for the area of self-control where you struggle with. The area where you have a hard time saying no. I don't have an easy answer. But I have the answer that we've been talking about for the last couple months. And that answer is this. 
Weed out the bad things in the garden of your heart. Take those things out. Submit your life to the Lord. Spend time filling your life with His Word. Spend time praying in the power of the Spirit. Go over the old, well-trodden paths, Christ follower. Renew the things that you know how to do. The spiritual disciplines that you've dropped, that you've set aside. Pick those back up again. In Hebrews it says, let's not give up the habit of meeting together. If you've been giving up the habit of meeting with other believers, worshiping together, studying the scriptures, I want to encourage you today, pick that back up. Pick it back up. Because if you do that, then you will be able to grow in the spirit of self-control. You will be able to be used according to God's plan and purpose. Ask the Lord to grow these fruits of the Spirit in your life. Love and joy and peace. Patience and kindness. Goodness. Faithfulness. Gentleness and self-control. This is not magic. It is the Lord. It is His doing. A thriving relationship with Him will grow all things that are good. This morning we handed out some Bibles to our third graders. They are learning how to study the Bible for themselves. And one of the things we encourage families to do is to do devotions together. I want to share with you very quickly. This, this summer, my kids came, came to um, Michelle and I, and they said, you know what? We stopped doing devotions as a family. We want to do devotions as a family again. And one of the things that, that occurred to us is that because of our busyness this last year, that got dropped by the wayside. We stopped doing it. And my kids came to me, and I, what am I going to say? No, kids, we're not going to do devotions. <laughs> you can't say that. I want to do that. But you know what? Kids, this is your takeaway today. If your parents aren't doing devotions with you on a daily basis or, or a regular basis, I want you to go to them and I want you to say, Mom, Dad, I want to do devotions. I want to do devotions. Kids, that's what your, your job description is to do today. I want to do devotions. Give me devotions, Mom and Dad. Mom and Dad, time to say yes. This is where you get to say yes, not no, okay? Okay? Because there are promises in the Lord that are yes and amen. And this is one of them. So I want to encourage you. It's time to pick some things back up that we've dropped off. It's time to rebuild the walls of self-control so that we can be used for God's glory. And I want to pray for all of us this morning. If there's an area where you say, I'm out of control here, I want to encourage you that you may need to get help. You may need to step out of your comfort zone and get help from somebody else because you just got to recognize, I can't do it by myself. If that's you, let me encourage you to make that decision today and to follow through with it. Because the benefits so far outweigh the, uh, the, the other side of that equation. So let's pray together this morning. Father, we thank you that your Holy Spirit is alive and is at work inside of us. And we want to say yes to you, God, in your work in us. We want to agree with you. We want to follow your lead. And we want to do things practically in the real world that will respond to how you're working in our lives. Lord, we also want to say no to the things that will keep us from you. We want to say no to those things that will put us out of your will. Help us to rebuild the walls, Lord, in our lives that have been broken down for whatever reason, Lord. Help us to rebuild it and help us, Lord, to live within the center of your holy and precious will. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.